let's talk about the case study. This was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Let's see where it ended up going. So here's how the patient, so first of all, you'll continue to do great. Uh, we really love the thought that you're, you're putting into it. Uh, I'll tell you how this case played out. So the patient was treated uh, with a perception. Now that you see these anti-NMDA receptor antibodies, clearly the immune system is involved. So what you do then is you try to suppress the immune system and also do uh, surgery. Okay, so two things were, were, were done, IV methylprednisolone. This has its own risks, uh, but uh, for an acute autoimmune-related process, uh, that's definitely indicated, particularly if it's uh, as serious as this patient was experiencing. And also, the surgery was carried out and the cyst was removed, okay? So patient got better initially. The patient was able to answer questions and write her name, so that's gone from non-responsive to that. That's pretty good. Uh, she was, uh, had her tracheostomy tube removed uh, on post-op day three. So she got better until post-op day six, when she became agitated, got paranoid, and had hallucinations again. Fixed lateral collis. What's that? That's this. Sometimes you can get these, these spasticities that happen. This is retro collis, neck going back. This is lateral collis, and it's very strange. Sometimes it develops these weird fixed uh, postures. Um, that had also occurred before treatment, so it looked like things were getting uh, uh, Certainly not uh, uh, working ideally. What could be going on here? The cyst is gone. Well, there's still, you know, the antibodies are still around, right? So we've got a, an issue here. Um, uh, we've got the causative problem out, um, but how long are these antibodies going to stick around? Um, and so then our old friend IVIG comes along. Okay, we talked about this a little bit. And so they gave her a pretty uh, serious intravenous uh, human immunoglobulin try to interrupt the ongoing process that resulted from the circulating antibodies. Anxiety and paranoia diminished, and she went to rehab facility on the 35th hospital day. So that's progress. Two months out, living at home with parents. That's better than being in the rehab facility. Um, but withdrawn and uninterested in things she used to do, sleeping 15 to 18 hours a day. So what's going on here? Yeah, it could be. Uh, depressive therapy was begun. So why did the depression follow that? Again, if we understood depression, I might be able to answer that. Um, but we know the hippocampus is involved in memory and mood, and we know she was driving it hard with these antibodies for a while. Maybe there was some kind of damage or fatigue that, that resulted from that, and that triggered depression. At the six-month follow-up, though, after antidepressant therapy, she actually resumed driving and working, uh, had her job back, Affect, meaning her, her public display of mood had, had recovered somewhat, uh, but she had some, uh, some significant weight gain, 32 kilograms in four months, okay? That can be a side effect of antidepressants, but that's a pretty big weight gain in four months. Um, was it the prednisolone that can cause weight gain, but that was a while back? Um, or is it just her altered activity pattern? Uh, some, sometimes it's a combination of all of these things. Neuropsych testing, intact memory, so that's great. Some inattention, some difficulty with calculations, slow information processing. So persistent deficits, um, and presumably those will continue to slowly correct over time. In the last few minutes, I want to share uh, this. I mentioned this book last time, uh, Brain on Fire, a really interesting popular press book. Uh, a young woman who lived in uh, New York, uh, was a journalist, uh, and basically this thing happened to her, okay, out of nowhere. And, and she had a very difficult time before she was diagnosed. Uh, she was basically, she didn't quite get into this uh, non-responsive state, but she got into this permanently crazy state. And she was heading toward, until she, the, she found a doctor that made the correct diagnosis, she was headed toward what would have been probably a lifetime of, of failed medication, uh, institutionalization. And it raises the question of what other psychiatric diseases are really due to something like this that might be treatable if we just knew what they were. So she's, she had some, she was treated with IVIG too. This is just a couple interesting quotes from the book. She describes sort of the this IVIG uh, process. Uh, you know, they gave her a lot, um, enough that came from more than a thousand blood donors, um, expensive, and she just was remarking on how 
intense and crude and expensive this treatment is, it ended up uh, uh, saving her, but uh, uh, the experience of IVIG uh, treatment was an interesting description. She also highlighted how terrifying it was, that how poorly understood it was. That was in 09. She was only the 217th person ever to receive that diagnosis. As the awareness grew, numbers in the thousands, obviously there's not an epidemic going on, it's just increased uh, awareness that this kind of thing can happen. Um, but it raises the, the question, I mean, she, she talks about the doctor who did his best and failed to make the, the diagnosis, and you know, she attributes it to various social political things, which could be the case, but really, if there were better understanding, that would solve everything. And so, um, I think there's a huge question here, how could we do a better job of diagnosis, understanding, and, and, and treatment. Um, so that was how this patient was treated, and so what we'd like to do, in, you know, in, um, in, your, in your next step, here's a little additional reading. We can post this letter. We actually took uh, the case from uh, case records of the Massachusetts General Hospital from the New England Journal of Medicine. You can read the actual uh, case history yourself. But this is maybe the most fun thing, is, is, is to think big then, looking to the future again, very limited in terms of the amount of uh, 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 text to generate, but think about what uh, a bioengineer could could do, bringing quantitative principles to diagnosis, pathophysiology, or treatment. Uh, go beyond existing things. Uh, how could we pick this up better, or things like this, things in this domain, um, and what sort of uh, you know unusual kinds or innovative kinds of uh, treatments might you think about based about what you know? Uh, just a chance for you to be creative and think and. Uh, and uh, talk together as a as a team. Okay. Any other questions on that? Yeah. No. This is definitely we see. I haven't seen myself a case like this, but we are routinely consulted for patients on medical or surgical uh, services where someone has become uh, uh, depressed or psychotic or or otherwise delirious, and they want to know what's going on. So that's one of the most interesting parts of psychiatry is, is getting called to the other units of the hospital when, when psychiatric-like state is induced. There are some stories on that, yeah.